Hi, my name is Rick Warren. I'm a product manager and engineer at RTI. Today I'd like to give you just a brief introduction to the concepts of data-centric architecture and to the data distribution service specification and technology in particular. You may have heard that DDS is data-centric. In this presentation, I'm going to describe to you what data centricity is, why it's a good way to build and integrate systems, and how DDS expresses that architecture specifically. I would propose to you that you actually already understand data centricity and what's beneficial about it. And my goal in this presentation is really just to give you the vocabulary and the concepts to articulate that. So let's take a quick example. Let's suppose that someone wants you to show up for a meeting at a particular time, and so they send you an email saying, please meet me in the conference room at 10 o'clock on Monday. Now suppose that the meeting needs to move, and so they send you another email. Then they have additional information to give you, and so they send you another email. So when Monday morning rolls around, you're thinking to yourself, do I have a meeting? Was it moved? And so you're rifling through your inbox trying to find all these emails, make sure you're looking at them in the right order, and you're trying to deduce what the current state of the meeting is. As an alternative, if you have a shared calendaring system at your job or among your friends, then whenever anyone needs you to be somewhere, they can just add an event to your calendar, and when that event changes, the calendar stays updated, so you can always go back to that calendar and see where you have to be at any given time. Let's take another example. Let's look at Facebook. Facebook has got a great website where you can go and you can see what your friends are doing and what their latest contact information is. And whenever things change on Facebook, it can send you notifications or SMS messages or emails that tell you what changed and uh, what the new status is of your friends. So suppose that the website didn't exist and all you had were these notifications. And when you wanted to find out what your friend's status was, you'd have to go back and correlate all these SMS messages and all these uh, emails and try to deduce it from that. So you probably have an idea from both of these examples which alternative is the better and easier to use. The difference between the approach that was easier to use and more reliable and the one that wasn't was that the better approach made state explicit. Things in the real world have attributes and characteristics that describe them. That's true of things that exist in the real world, and it's also true of things that exist only in the digital world. And that's true whether or not we decide to observe that information at a particular point in time or not. We call the snapshot of all of these traits that an object has its state. And when that state exists in a computer, we call it data. Systems are easier to build, faster to implement, and more reliable to use when we can operate directly on the state of the objects that we care about, rather than exchanging meta-information about changes to that state and having to work backwards. So what's the quick definition of data centricity? A data-centric architecture is one that focuses on describing the world as it is, that gives you those stateful snapshots at particular points in time. One of the important implications of a data-centric architecture is that when you make the state explicit, it's now visible to be acted upon by automation. Your communications infrastructure can maintain that state and distribute it and reason about it in ways that make your life easier. A system that's not data-centric is often focused on sending commands point-to-point, telling one actor to do one thing on behalf of another, or describing changes or differences that have occurred over time. Those types of interactions assume that state was in a particular way before they were invoked, and that the state will be in another way after they're invoked, but they don't make those state changes explicit. And that causes a lot of coupling between applications, and it also means that each application is going to be responsible for inferring and reconstructing the state that it cares about independent of other applications. And we'll see why that's a problem later on. You might hear the word message centricity. This is what we're talking about when we use a term like that. We mean a focus on what's being said in the dialogue between different components rather than on what is, what the status of those components is. So why does it matter? Why should we prefer a data-centric approach to a message-centric approach? Well, first of all, Inferring the state of the world based on all the communications about the world that you've previously received is pretty difficult and pretty expensive. You've got to maintain all this metadata, you've got to correlate it together, and if each application has to maintain the state that's relevant to it, there's going to be a lot of duplicate work that's done among all these different components. And while you're doing all that work, you could make mistakes. 
one copy of the state might be inconsistent with another, or you might miss a message so that a subsequent change is interpreted relative to an incorrect previous state. And this leads the model of the state that exists within your system to diverge from the real world by a greater and greater extent over time. In contrast, when you can treat state explicitly and uniformly and apply simple operations across states of all different kinds, you reduce the chance for these kinds of errors. So that covers building systems on time. In the real world, we're probably going to be maintaining systems for an extended period of time. And so we have to consider what's the ramification of integrating applications one-to-one -one based on the specific functions that those applications carry out versus integrating applications with a common picture of stateful data. Well, if you're going to integrate applications based on what they do, that implies that each application knows what functions the other applications carry out. That creates a lot of coupling that makes it very difficult for you to take out one application and add in another in the next version because that specific functionality had dependencies on it spread throughout your system and now you've got to go and touch all those other points. In contrast, if you integrate applications with a common picture of the state that they care about, independent of the particular functions that will be carried out as a result of changes to that state, then you've now eliminated that coupling and it becomes much easier to add and remove functionality over time. Furthermore, and more fundamentally, if every application has to integrate directly with other applications based on their function, that means that the effort to do this integration is going to scale with the square of the number of applications because you've got to manage each point-to-point -point connection. In contrast, if you integrate the applications with a common state picture, each application only needs to be integrated one time with that common state picture. Let's boil this down. If systems are easier to build and easier to integrate, you're going to bring your products to market sooner and at less expense. And if it's easier to change those systems over time, that means it's going to be easier to release that version 2.0 and to do piecewise upgrades of different components and subsystems independently without having to go revisit everything that you've already done. And when systems are more reliable, and more resilient to change, you protect the mission-critical functionality of your systems. Before we move on to DDS in particular, let me just state a concise definition of data centricity. Now that we have our intuitive understanding, let's nail it down. So a data-centric system is first of all based on a formal data model. That's formal both with respect to human beings who can read it and understand it, and also with respect to computers and automation that can use it to carry out useful functions on our behalf. And furthermore, that data model has to be discoverable at runtime. That word data model is a little bit scary or can sound esoteric, but I'm just talking about, for example, the types of data structures that you might find in an OMG IDL file or in an XML schema file. For example, I might have a formal definition that states that a calendar event has a start time, a duration, things of that nature. Secondly, the data model that underlies the architecture should be independent of any particular functionality or application that uses it. That is, it describes the state of certain objects in terms of what they are, not what they do. And finally, the instantiation of that data model, the data store, or the data bus, should be the only authoritative source of state in your system. Now let's get into DDS in particular. DDS didn't originate the concept of data centricity. There are other technologies out there that let you express architectures of this kind. For example, relational databases or web protocols. But those technologies tend to assume that the objects in the world change pretty slowly. And when you're accessing that data, they tend to use network resources inefficiently. For example, if you've got 100 applications that all need a particular piece of information, usually it's going to be 100 times more expensive to get that information to them than if you only had one application, which causes some pretty significant scalability and distribution challenges. Finally, these technologies tend to be highly centralized so that failures that occur at a central point can actually degrade or destroy the capability of a large number of applications. DDS, in contrast, allows you to observe frequent changes to the world of interest, 
and it uses network resources very efficiently. That applies to wide area networks as well as local networks in terms of the efficiency with which data is encapsulated and represented on the network. And local networks in particular, DDS can take advantage of multicast so that the load on the network is independent of the number of applications. You can have hundreds of applications accessing the same data using the same level of resources as a single application would. And finally, DDS has a decentralized topology so that a failure in any particular application doesn't take out the whole network. DDS communications are also governed with explicit quality of service that allows you to manage and monitor which applications are able to communicate in which ways with the data bus and with each other. Just so it's not so hypothetical, let me give you a real-world use case. The U.S. Army has a program called JBCP, or otherwise known as Blue Force Tracker, which is responsible for keeping track of the locations of different objects on a battlefield. The original version of this system was developed with a homegrown messaging solution. It's now being upgraded to use DDS instead. And their experience is that the new version of this system, based on DDS, is able to track 20 times more objects than the previous generation. And furthermore, it's able to do that with increased reliability, with significantly less code and with significantly lower CPU utilization. They've gone from a whole rack of machines down to just one or two. Now we return full circle to the phrase that we saw at the beginning, DDS's data-centric messaging. A lot of people out there use DDS the same way they would use any other messaging technology. It provides high performance, it provides efficient peer-to-peer -peer communication, and that works really great but they're still building their systems the same way they were building their systems before they were using DDS. So they're getting incremental value, but I hope based on what we've talked about so far today that you understand that when you use DDS in this way, you're really only getting a small amount of the value that you can get out of the technology. DDS is really about distributing stateful data, accessing it and querying it in motion in an analogous way to how you would access it and query it at rest from a database or another data-centric technology. It's about taking that architecture that's been proven for many years and making that architecture available for a much wider class of applications, for a much wider class of problems. Let's dig a little bit deeper into some of the specific concepts and terminology that you're going to hear when you start to work with DDS. First of all, the world of all the things that you're interested in in a particular subsystem is called a domain. A domain is a way that you can isolate one subsystem from another. For example, suppose that we're in a hospital and we have a lot of medical devices that exchange information. Within that domain, you're going to have what are called topics. If you're using DDS in a data-centric way, a topic is more than just an abstract destination. It's really a group of similar things in the world of interest. When I say similar, I'm talking about both similar in terms of their structure. For example, a reading you get from an EKG is going to have a different structure than a reading you get from a thermometer. Also, I mean similar in the way that they can be observed to change over time. And in DDS, that's called the quality of service. For example, EKG readings are going to need to be propagated with a certain level of reliability, they're going to need to have a certain level of availability, and they're going to change at a certain rate. Within a topic, that is, within a group of similar objects, you of course have all of the individual objects that each may change over time. So for example, you might have many EKG monitors spread around the hospital connected to different patients, and each instance might be the stream of readings from a particular patient. Finally, we use the word sample to refer to the state of an instance as of a particular moment in time. If you're thinking of DDS as messaging, the sample is your message, but you can see it also fits into a broader architectural picture. The way that you produce and consume samples is through objects called data writers and data readers, where the writer is your source of information about the group of objects that are in a topic, and a data reader allows you to observe how they change over time. So I hope I've convinced you by this point that data-centric architecture, regardless of which technologies you use to implement it, can bring you significant business benefits. It allows you to bring products to market sooner and with less effort. It allows you to update and evolve systems over time without having to revisit all of the work that you've done previously. And it allows you to protect those mission-critical capabilities with systems that are more resilient and highly available. When you're looking at how to implement this type of architecture, DDS can provide a powerful enabler either by itself or as a complement to other technologies that you might be using. 
and allows you to develop systems that are highly reactive and event-driven and based on open standards from the object management group. DDS uses CPU and network resources very efficiently so that if your concern is the amount of hardware that you need in order to support a given capability, by using DDS you can reduce that hardware footprint significantly. On the other hand, if your concern is offering maximum capability with maximum performance, DDS can help you there as well. And with the same hardware resources, you can actually provide significantly greater performance and greater functionality. And because DDS supports a distributed peer-to-peer -to -peer topology with no single points of failure, you can provide those capabilities more deterministically and more reliably, and at the same time monitor and govern those systems in real time. Thank you for your attention. If you're interested in learning more about DDS or about RTI, you can visit us on the web where you can grab evaluation copies of our software for free, demo applications, examples, and of course a lot of other information.